of two panels by the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. The ICNA Social Justice Council very kindly gave us two panels. They are a member of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, which is a human rights and social justice advocacy organization for Muslim war on terror prisoners in the United States. Um, I was gonna say that this is an unpopular topic, but uh, clearly it's very popular today. Um, we're talking entrapment cases, uh, FBI manufactured crimes and informants. So I'll just go ahead and give a shout out to the informants here tonight. And uh, you know, you're probably working overtime, so maybe you're getting time and a half tonight. Um, you know who you are. Yeah, they, they sure do. Um, so hello. And uh, I will give a brief introduction of myself and the topic. Uh, my name is Lina Larian. I'm the co-director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. As I said, it's an advocacy organization for Muslim prisoners in the United States, war on terror prisoners. Um, we, uh, we do, uh, you know, we have a Ramadan gifts program. Each uh, year we send $100 to prisoners' commissary accounts. So uh, here's a quick pitch to get you guys to donate. Uh, to support a prisoner. We have over 200 war on terror prisoners uh, who need our support, so come find us. We also have a mock solitary confinement cell in the bazaar, so you could see some of the um, horrible conditions that prisoners are kept in. Um, so we're here today to talk about these important cases. We have Ashley Young. She's the sister of Nicholas Young. Um, I'll read her bio shortly. Kathy Manley, who's our uh, d legal director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. And I'm sure many of you know Hassan Shibley of CARE Florida. We're very honored to have this great panel to talk to you tonight. Uh, how did the Coalition for Civil Freedoms get established? So my father was actually one of the first terrorism cases in the United States post 9-11. Uh, his name uh, is Samuel Aryan. He was a professor at the University of South Florida. Um, after, you know, it was it 52 months of solitary confinement, of pretrial detention, horrible prison conditions where he was forced to be uh, handcuffed behind his back, carry his legal documents, that, you know, as he was shackled to meet his attorneys, uh, and, you know, conditions that Amnesty International uh, characterized as gratuitously punitive. Um, alhamdulillah, eventually he and his three other co-defendants uh, came back, the jury came back in their case, didn't return a single guilty verdict. Um, and uh, after his case eventually ended, of course, there were some other legal hoops we had to jump through. He uh, was brought to Virginia to testify in another case. It was a perjury trap where a very vicious right-wing a uh, prosecutor who had a vendetta, wanted to punish him because they didn't secure that conviction they wanted, kept bringing him. Eventually he was charged with uh, criminal contempt, but released on house arrest. So literally the Coalition for Civil Freedom started while my father was on house arrest. He started it with other dedicated activists, such as Mel Underbaki, the director of the Coalition for Civil Freedom. She's in the audience. She's a wonderful person. She rallied the community in Tampa when nobody else did um, to defend my father and the other Muslim prisoners. And she founded the Friends of Human Rights, which eventually became a founding member of the coalition. There's Kathy Manley. She's an attorney for other Muslim prisoners in New York. Um, and she, you know, she and her uh, community there, they joined, some other activists joined the these meetings. So my father knew that he couldn't turn his back on other prisoners and so we're keeping up the fight and we're continuing to advocate on behalf of prisoners. Today many of you may have heard about the acquittal of Noor Salman, which, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, a takbir and applause. Um, we're very proud to say that the coalition was one of the leading organizations that came out in support of her and led the advocacy for her on the ground and with the media. So we're very proud of our work um, and on her behalf. 
Uh, unfortunately, there are other cases like Nicholas Young, which didn't end in a positive result. In fact, Nur Salman is the only acquittal in 12 years um, in a terrorism trial. They almost always result in convictions because of the anti-Muslim bias and hostility. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ashley Young, and I will quickly read her bio for you. Um, Ashley Young lives in Washington, D.C. and is an animal rights advocate who has been working in animal welfare for the majority of her adult life. She currently works for the Humane Rescue Alliance in our nation's capital. She has two undergraduate degrees in the arts from James Madison University. Her advocacy for animals shifted to humans when her older brother, Nick Young, was arrested on August 3rd, 2016, becoming the first law enforcement officer to be charged with terrorism. And uh, if you wonder, you know, what is the factor? He is Muslim, so that, that's why. Um, and uh, hold on, I have to move the mic, so one second. Okay. Right, Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to speak about my brother's case. Unfortunately, I wish it was under different circumstances. Um, as Lena said, he is the first law enforcement officer to be arrested, charged, now found guilty, now in prison on charges of terrorism. He was uh, charged with material support to terrorism, um, which if you, if you pay attention to any of these cases, you will see that charge coming up over and over and over again. It's a very broad charge that can um, literally cover anything from A to Z, um, which makes it so difficult in these cases. But so to talk about my brother on um, August 3rd, 2016, uh, he was arrested and charged with material support to terrorism for sending $245 worth of Google Play gift cards to a paid informant who posed as his friend for over two years. It is this Google Play gift card and his decision to send it that put him in prison for 15 years. And after 15 years, he has been sentenced to supervised release for another 15 years. So, my 94-year-old Nana was watching the news that morning and saw that my brother was arrested. Uh, my phone started ringing off the hook with reporters calling to see if I had any comments about my brother's arrest for terrorism. Uh, of course, I had no idea what they were talking about. And one of my best friends called me and he explained to me what was going on before I had even spoken to my family. And he said, you've got to get yourself together. Your brother will be appearing in federal court at 2 p.m. Um, so I went there by myself in a room full of uh, people from the government, um, people on the prosecution, filled reporters. I was the only person there by myself and I saw my brother come out with his police uniform still partway on. Um, he was arrested from work. <clears throat> so I have, a, I have a bunch of notes and stuff that, that I wanted to go over. Um, but the case goes back to the beginning Starting in 2010, it would be the first time that the FBI spoke to my brother. He met a man on his college campus that he used to go to. Only a few times someone introduced them. Once, the second time he saw him there, um, the guy asked him about uh, becoming an, a police officer. My brother said, well, you're too young um, right now, but you could go into the cadet program. If you have an interest, here's my phone number. That was all he knew of this man. Um, this man, his name is Zach Chesser, he was arrested in 2010, um, sentenced for 25 years for, for terrorism charges. Um, the police, or sorry, the FBI um, called my brother out of work um, to speak to him, interrogate him, why did this man have your phone number? I was so shocked, so shocked when my brother told me. 
Um, I was angry. I was, I was pissed off in the manner in which they questioned him. Um, and then I found out later that they had also gone to my mom's house. Um, they lied to her. They made her cry, left her in tears, questioned her about my brother. Um, and to my knowledge, that was the last time, the F first and last time the FBI spoke to my brother. He did not tell me about their continued pursuits of them, uh, probably because I had such a strong reaction to it in the first place. In 2011 would be the first time the FBI sent someone into my brother's life. Um, it was an undercover FBI agent who became friends with him through his mosque. This man was going around to mosques in the area, taking classes, becoming friends with men. They met at someone's wedding. That's how long this man was, was here, posing as someone he wasn't through the mosque. They had become such good friends with someone that he was invited to their wedding. Okay, so that's the first time my brother met him. They became friends immediately. The undercover FBI agent testified in court that it wasn't hard for him to become friends with Nick. They hit it off right off the bat. He said it felt like they were old friends. They hung out together. They talked about girls. They talked about school. Um, they went to movies together. They prayed together. He up and disappeared out of my brother's life. In retrospect, we're able to look clearly and see what this man, the purpose in this man's life, was, in my brother's life was. At the time, my brother, he didn't really think anything of it. He didn't know why his friend didn't talk to him anymore. He didn't understand why his friend left town. Um, so after, this man was in my brother's life for about a year and a half, and he testified that um, Nick never talked about anything that was a plan against the United States. Um, he never made any threats. Um, basically, it, the well ran, ran dry with him. And the FBI said, you know what, okay, you're, you're done with him. There's nothing to see here. Move on. But they didn't move on because a year and a half later, someone else was back in my brother's life. And this man maintained a friendship with my brother for over two years. At a different mosque in the area is how my brother met this friend. Okay, he was a paid informant by the FBI. My brother's best friend met him when this informant was sitting at the feet of the imam. The imam of this mosque introduced my brother's best friend to him. Okay, this is two mosques. Two different men working for the FBI infiltrating different friend groups, navigating through friend groups, and picking up on anyone who fall in their way. So one part of my brother's trial that was so important is that, first of all, we decided to go to trial. We know that only 2% of these cases um, end in anything other than a guilty verdict, uh, but it didn't matter. We were going to trial, it did not matter. Um, the biggest thing was that we were calling on the entrapment defense. That my brother would have never committed the crime if the government didn't induce it, if they didn't plan it, if they didn't give him the means to do it. He would never be speaking to anyone about these things if it wasn't the FBI speaking to him about it. Um, so part of the entrapment defense lies on before the government, before the government first became involved in his life, did he have a predisposition to commit the crime he's charged with? The entrapment defense lies on that. Were they predisposed to commit the crime they're charged with before the government came into their lives? So after they ransacked my brother's house, um, they saw a bunch of Nazi stuff in my brother's house. And they called the prosecutor and said, we don't know if this is within the scope of what we can take from his house, because it has nothing to do with the charged crime. He said, go ahead and take it. So they used this evidence to be able to draw a connection between Nazi, neo-Nazi, white supremacist inclinations 
to that being the reason why my brother would be predisposed to commit a crime of terrorism, militant Islamic terrorism, and white supremacist Nazis. So a bunch of the stuff they got from my brother's house was um, because he was part of a World War II reenactment group. For over 10 years, my brother was one of those people who would do reenactments. People would come, they'd watch. He would go to military bases. They were part of the um, historical reenactor society. And his uniform, the stuff that they used in their reenactments, were used to say that he was a Nazi. In trial, when we wanted to talk about how two of the years that my brother was under investigation, he was dating and wanted to marry a Jewish girl, that stuff was not allowed into trial. The fact that my grandfather on my mom's side is Jewish, that was not allowed into trial. Okay. Um, so we said, so I just wanted to read you something that was in one of the motions. Uh, Mr. Young's trial saw the admission of dozens of pieces of Nazi white supremacist and anti-Semitic anti evidence over multiple trial days. The court admitted into evidence an image of a burning cross, which by the way was a CD cover of his, the art cover on a CD that was used as um, evidence. A cartoon of Jewish people depicted as pigs a dirtied Israeli flag, and the defendant costumed as a Nazi standing before an oversized swastika. Mr. Young was neither charged with nor investigated for a hate crime. Such evidence has never before been admitted into federal court for militant Islam terrorist crime and quite possibly in any other type of federal litigation. Inflammatory, repulsive, and prejudicial, these materials challenge an, item, an itemized accounting of the trial's fundamental fairness. There is no case law to cite on this issue as the courts have never admitted such evidence. Its admission here was a category error. On top of that, the only way that they could um, connect these two things was that the government paid an expert an expert witness to write a report on my brother. They paid him almost $20,000 to write a report that has never been written before on my brother. Um, and the court allowed this in as expert witness testimony. Um, The expert witness in trial offered testimony based on information from blogs in a foreign language that he could not read. He admitted that he had them translated through Google Translate. Um, it had never been uh, the subject of being a Nazi white supremacist, which is why he was became an Islamic terrorist, had never before been contested in a civil or criminal trial on any matter. Um, it's never been testified about a uh, hypothesized white supremacist militant Islam convergent and has never been the subject of any expert testimony in any federal court. So like I said, uh, unfortunately, trial did not end up the way we wanted it to. A six-year investigation was um, crammed into five days and the jury found my brother guilty and he was sentenced to 15 years and then another 15 years supervised release. I had never been aware or taken the time to be aware of any of these types of um, trials, any of these types of arrest. So this was uh, definitely when I started reading about things, I was floored. I was disgusted. I was ashamed. 
these trials, these arrests, they're un-American. They go against the, the civil freedoms that we've been entitled to that we're supposed to have in America. <clears throat> So I just wanted to speak real quickly because I remember um, speaking with Lena's older sister, Layla, and realizing that their father's case happened a good 10 years more before my brother's case. And I wanted to ask her, why, why did not more people hear about this issue, these cases, the injustice? And you guys have been trying to speak about it for years and years and years. How come nobody's heard about this? And she looked at me and said, because nobody cares about Muslims. I refuse to believe that. <laughs> to this day, I refuse to believe it. I don't accept it. I don't think it's because people don't care. It's because they don't know. Okay? And so, Seeing people here who are willing to listen today, it gives me a lot of hope. Because when my brother was arrested, nobody came. All his friends over all the years, only a few of them stood up for him. My brother was part of two communities. He was a cop. He had been a cop for 13 years. And he was also a Muslim, had been Muslim for 10 years. And both communities turned their back on my brother. Nobody wanted anything to do with us. I remember calling some of my brother's friends. I remember one of their dads telling me whatever I was trying to find to stop and leave everyone alone, not to look to call anyone else. The secrecy problem in these trials doesn't just happen in the courtroom, it happens in the community because people are too scared to talk about it. But then we sit in trial and we ask a jury, we ask a judge to care. Why should any of them care if people from the community won't show that they care? Okay? So it's a systemic problem. It's not just the courts. It's not just the government. It's us as a people being able to have to look at our moral compass and decide what for humanity we have to stand up for something, okay? Thank you. Yeah. I just want to add one thing that um, Ashley's brother, he, his nickname, I don't think you mentioned, is Officer Friendly. In 15 years on the force, yeah. not a single time did he ever use force with anybody. People loved him. He was the kind of person that got along with everybody, that always smiled, and it's very sad that uh, these informants target the best among us, people with the kindest hearts who will let you in. Um, I just wanted to gauge the, the information that the room has. I wanted to ask how many of you know, um, estimated how many paid informants there are infiltrating our communities. If anybody has a number, you can... Uh, you know, raise your hand or shout it out. How many informants do you think are currently infiltrating our communities? Paid informants. How many? 50? 15, 15, over 15,000 are currently infiltrating the community. Um, and a part of it, in my view, is to, the government wants to depoliticize our communities, right? So, you know, you can't have a political opinion without it becoming a violent political opinion. So, uh, I saw this uh, meme one time, if somebody is talking to you about violent jihad, that person is, a, is an informant. So, uh, stay aware, stay vigilant, and uh, don't let anybody fool you. Um, I thought it was kind of funny when we were sitting. It's like the non-Muslims on this side and the Muslims on that side. I'm thinking we need to switch it up, yeah. Um, it's not good optics. Uh, we're all here allies. Um, next, I'm gonna introduce Kathy. And um, 
you know, there's a term that we use often in our work, it's called preemptive prosecution. And this is a term that you guys need to understand when you hear about manufactured plots, because what is it to manufacture a plot to be, you know, uh, charged with these uh, material support cases when the government invents it from A to Z? So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy in a minute, but not before I read her bio, so one second. Okay, Kathy Manley, as I said earlier, is the legal director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Now a solo practitioner, Kathy was at Kindlin? Okay, all right, Shanks, okay. She's an attorney and she was one for many years. Uh, Kathy's main emphasis is criminal defense and constitutional rights. She concentrates on appeals and has written many winning briefs before the New York State Court of Appeals. Kathy works with many civil rights groups, including Project Salam, the Muslim Solidarity Committee, and the National Lawyers Guild. She is also the vice president of the Albany chapter of the New York Civil Liberties Union, Kathy has received many awards for her work, including the Carol S. Knox Award from the New York Civil Liberties Union Capital Region Chapter in 2015, among others. Uh, please help me welcome Kathy Manley. Thanks, Lena. Um, good evening. It's, it's great to see so many people here. Um, this is important stuff we're talking about. Um, I, I got involved in this um, in 2004 when um, I was part of the legal team for an imam in Albany, New York, named Yassin Araf. He and his co-defendant, Mohammed Hussein, were entrapped in a FBI sting operation that was really ludicrous. Um, they were totally innocent. It was bizarre because in sting operations, usually there's, there's always recorded conversations with the informant, and usually they get the targets for various reasons, they get them to say things that sound bad on the tapes. But in this case, that never happened. There was like no evidence against Yassine, except there was a lot of secret evidence that the um, judge got to see. And so he made all these rulings against Yassine. And like we made a motion to dismiss the case um, based on um, illegal wiretapping and the not only the prosecution's response, but the judge's decision was completely classified, so we couldn't even read them. Like, that totally destroys the Sixth Amendment right to confront evidence against you, any kind of due process. That, so, so basically, I, I won't go into all the, the details of that case, or even hardly any of them, because we don't have time. But it really opened my eyes to how unfair the system can be when it's really a vendetta against a certain group of people that um, the government is paranoid about. They are afraid after 9-11, they became terrified that, oh, anybody, any Muslim could be doing this to us. And, and they became, um, like, they didn't care about all the damage they did to innocent people. The idea was what Dick Cheney talked about with the 1% solution, where if there's a 1% chance that somebody might in the future do something against this country, we have to get rid of them now. We have to lock them up or deport them or something. And that's kind of the mentality that the FBI has been using in these cases. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I didn't realize that back then. I just thought, wow, this is, I started learning how unfair it can be, but I thought maybe this is an isolated example. I didn't realize that there were so many other cases until, um, we started studying them. It was, um, well, 2010, Lena's brother, Ali, came looking for us in, when there was a peace conference in Albany, New York, which is where I'm from. And the reason they knew about us is because Yassin Araf, after he had been convicted, he started writing the story of his life. He's Kurdish from Iraq, and he wrote the story of his life called Son of Mountains. And we self-published it and got it out there and you sold about a thousand copies or so, but one of them we sent to, um, well, Le uh, Lena's sister Layla ended up with it and from Al Jazeera. And uh, since her dad, Sammy, was in house arrest in that apartment, he saw the book and looked at it and said, oh, wow, we, we need to get in touch with, because we wrote about his case, too, in the 
Um, the funny part it, is like how somebody put it on my sister's debt. Like you sent it to the network, but somebody was like, oh, she'll, she'll care about that. That was great. I mean, just serendipity. So yeah. that's how we got connected. Um, we met Ali and then we came to meet Dr. Sami in the house because he was under house arrest. And then we formed the, the um, Coalition for Civil Freedoms in 2010. And one of the things that we um, worked on was studying these cases, like really studying them, like how, what happened in the other cases? What, what is the government doing and how is it doing it? And did these people commit crimes? Like, so we actually had a list that the government came up with um, around 2000, late 2010 or 2011, there was a list of 299 cases that the Department of Justice called foreign terrorism or terrorism cases. And guess what? They were all Muslim, all, like 99% Muslim, and they were all convicted and because this preemptive prosecution model had been used in them. But I thought, all right, well, 299 cases, maybe like at least half of them probably are more like actually committed, must have committed real terrorism crimes. But when, when I looked into these cases, and this was, so there's been a bunch since, we need to update it, but this is 2001 to 2010, only four, four of those 299 cases were people who had committed violent acts within the US or had even attempted to. And about another eight had either committed violent acts outside of the US or attempted to. And the rest did nothing, really. It was just either material support for terrorism, like this sending a Google Play card, didn't, went out, and that was a sting operation. A lot of times material support charges are in sting operations too. So there's a lot of the cases are um, involve material support charges where you don't have to have any intent to do anything violent according to the Supreme Court. Um, just uh, material support in any way to any designated terrorist organization, which is a group that whatever the government decides is a terrorist group, which is <coughs> problematic and uh, to say the least. Um, and you don't even have to, you could be helping the group to work out its differences peacefully and you can still be convicted of material support for terrorism. Um, so a lot of the cases are sting operations, and Ashley talked about um, how there's supposed to be an entrapment defense, but there really isn't an entrapment defense um, anymore, at least not for Muslims, because, and, and actually um, the jury instructions that the judge is supposed to read to the jury in these cases helped to destroy the entrapment defense. Um, this happened, I think one of the earliest cases when it happened was in our case in Albany, when Yassin, Yassin wasn't even arguing entrapment because he didn't even know anything illegal was going on. He really didn't. But his co-defendant had some idea of something. He wasn't supporting it, it was a loan, it was very complicated. The guy was saying he wanted to help him and he didn't have to pay back all the money he loaned. And it was supposed to be money laundering, but they didn't understand that, but anyway. Um, the judge told um, the jury that predisposition, if, if there was no predisposition, if the people hadn't had any ideas or behavior before the informant came into their life that showed they supported terrorism, that's okay because another form of predisposition is if they don't back out of the plot before they get arrested. This is this is what the juries get told. So if somebody did back out and, and not come back to the informant, they're probably not even gonna be arrested, at least not in a sting operation. So there is no entrapment defense. That's what happened in a case called the Newberg Four. In um, same informant, Shahed Hussein, who was in um, the case in Albany, they sent him after he was so successful in convicting two totally innocent people in Albany, they sent him down a couple hours down um, towards New York City in a little town called Newburgh, New York, an impoverished town. 
and they sent him into a mosque with no evidence against anybody in the mosque. Now, the FBI, if you ask them, they'll say they don't do that. Well, they did that, and they do that all the time. They sent this guy into the mosque. He hung out there for a year, didn't find anybody who even wanted to talk to him when he would try to say whatever he was saying. He talked about how rich he was and how he was involved in this and that, and he had all these fancy cars. He eventually got kicked out of the mosque. He got nowhere. He was in the parking lot of this mosque in Newburgh when he started talking to this guy named James Cromedy, who was kind of a con artist himself. So it was like these two con artists talking to each other. But James was in big trouble because Shahed Hussain had something over on him because James was trying to, you know, Shahed Hussain's like this, oh, I'm this really rich guy. You know, we can work together. I can give you all this stuff. I don't know. You know, I can give you a car, I can set you up in business, you know. I work for this group called JEM, Jaishi Muhammad. And James, James, who had no political feelings at all, had no, wasn't political, wasn't, um, had no uh, support of terrorism, nothing like that. He started lying and saying, oh yeah, I'm a terrorist, I did all this stuff in Afghanistan. Like, he just made this stuff up just lied, said that he had set off bombs, like he had never done anything like that. He was like a drug dealer, like, and he was just trying to con money out of Shahed Hussain. And this went on for a while, where they were trying to con each other, and, and Shahed Hussain's like, oh yeah, you gotta come up with a plot, but James couldn't even figure out how to read the map, and it was like really crazy. And so Shahed Hussain had to come up with all the details, pick the targets, and, and then say, well, we need some other people because you can't have a conspiracy with just an informant. They wanted a conspiracy, too. That's a very strong law in federal court uh, conspiracy. They could do a lot with conspiracy charges. So they wanted a few other people involved, too. But after a while, James was getting sick of this guy, and he just like wanted nothing to do with him, so he just disappeared for a few months. Finally, Shahed Hussain gets him on the phone again and says, oh, brother, I promised you $250,000 and you don't want it, which he had never promised that before. And James is like, oh, oh I'm in, I'm in, yeah, okay, yeah. Right, and, and Shahed Hussain didn't know because he didn't have his recording device turned on. He could turn it on and off at will. He didn't know that, sh that obviously he should have thought about it, but he's not too smart sometimes. But anyway, it worked out for the government anyway. But he didn't know that the government was tapping James Cromedy's phone. So this conversation was recorded. And it eventually, eventually, like right before the trial, the, the government should have turned it over to the defense like right away as soon as they realized they had it, but they didn't. But the, this was a good bunch of defense lawyers and they finally got this thing saying, to, oh, I offered you $250,000 and you didn't want it. And then James says, oh, okay, I'm in again. That is like the definition of what entrapment should be. That if, you, if that's not entrapment, there is no entrapment, right? Eventually, at the end, he gets three other guys to come in at the last minute and offers them $5,000 each. That's also entrapment, right? And they had no predisposition either. And I was hopeful that they would be acquitted, but no, they got convicted. They get convicted and sentenced to 25 years each. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing that the government can get away with because they have this fear that people have of Muslims. These guys were sort of Muslim. They weren't particularly Muslim. I mean, like in our case in Albany, Shahed Hussain came to my client, the Imam, and the guy, his co-defendant who founded the mosque and said, teach me about Islam because he didn't really know much. But with the Newberg case, he was, Shahed Hussain was supposed to be the expert and he couldn't even name the five pillars of Islam. These guys knew less than that. I mean, they weren't, they had sort of converted to Islam in prison, but they didn't really practice it. They didn't really know much. So this was a case where the government wasn't even paranoid about these guys as Muslims. They just wanted a case. They just wanted another victory in the war on terror. They sent this guy down to the mosque for a year and this is all he could come up with. And, and they poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into this case and they got their 25 years each for these four hapless guys. So that's, that's an um, extreme example, but there's so many examples of sting operations where there's um, vulnerable young men. A lot of them are mentally ill. Some of them, I mean, an informant can do a lot with somebody who's mentally ill and suggestible. 
they can get them to say a lot of things um, and show them pictures of atrocities and get them all riled up and you know just kind of push them along the path that they want and then um, they get arrested and they get charged with material support and conspiracy if there's somebody else involved and then some of them were even found not to be competent to stand trial because they were so mentally ill. And I don't know if you know, but that's like you have to be really, really mentally ill to, to be found not competent for trial. I mean, and I just looked in our database and saw that there were several examples of that it just recently in these so-called ISIS cases. Um, so there's a lot of um, tools that the government uses we're going to have questions and answers at the end, okay? And I'll probably wrap up my part, and then we'll we'll finish up with Hassan. But um, so they use sting operations, they use material support laws, they use secret evidence um, in a lot of these cases where the defense doesn't even get to see the evidence that the judge gets to see and makes decisions based on that evidence. Um, they have experts, so-called experts, that are just people who are going to say whatever the prosecution wants them to say. And, and like ours was Evan Coleman, the so-called Google expert, because he didn't really, he would just go on Google a little bit before the trial and look this stuff up. Um, and they have this sensationalist evidence, like this Nazi stuff in his case. And, um, Sometimes they'll show videos of people blowing up buses which have nothing to do with the case, but they're saying, oh, you supported this group, that this group does this sometimes, so therefore it's connected to you and we get to show this to the jury. They just have a lot of techniques that in combination with the fear um, allows them to convict people with basically no evidence and people need to, to be aware of that more. And so we've been trying to raise awareness about that with the um, Coalition for Civil Freedoms. And also um, we've been trying to work with the families. That's how we met Ashley. Well, we met her. I don't know how we first connected I, to you. I but, found yeah. out about you guys. Yeah. I was doing a ton of research. And okay. I reached out to you guys so she reached out to us and then we invited her to our family conference because a lot of the family members in these cases, I mean, the defendants are innocent and their family members are totally innocent. Even if the defendant did something little thing wrong, the family members certainly are totally innocent and, and should not be ostracized from their communities, but all too often that's what happens. They're, sometimes they're turned away from their mosque, nobody wants to talk to them, they lose their friends, and it's really tragic um, for these people who've sometimes lost their breadwinners. The breadwinner of the family may be the one that's locked up um, so one of the things we do every year is we get together um, with the family members from these cases and they, it's sort of a support group and we try to help them empower each other and learn to work together and to, to fight back and to educate people about this stuff and tell their stories. So and that was so Ashley for, came for and we went, form. we did some lobbying, very difficult environment, but we did it and we actually it went better than I thought because we have real people telling their stories, and some of these aides were listening to that. So um, another thing we do that we're fundraising for now is um, Ramadan. Every Ramadan, we give um, commissary gifts to the people who are in prison, $100 in their commissary account. Some of these people have nothing in their commissary account, so that's um, something that we've been doing every year, and it's very appreciated by these people who are really, really isolated in prison, and really having a rough time, so.